Hi everyone, welcome to our class on Java Collections Framework. Today we'll talk about lists, stacks, queues, and priority queues, which are the main collections in the Java Collection Framework. And the next class we are going to talk about sets and maps. So I separated this Java Collections Framework into two groups, the collections and basically the sets and uh, what are called dictionaries in Python or maps. So today we'll start with the first part, list, text, queues, and priority queues. We also have a quiz for the day, which I will talk about in a couple of minutes. It's basically a simple program to match parentheses, open and close parentheses, and we have multiple kinds of parentheses, and the best way to solve this problem is with a stack. So you will see how to use a stack, in fact, from the Java Collections framework. So really the goal of the class today is to learn about data structures, the main data structures that you use for any kind of, uh, in any programming language, for any kind of algorithm. Uh, and we are going to split it in two. We'll talk about the collections today and uh, maps and dictionaries and uh, sets next class. So the objectives for today's uh, class is really to understand Java Collections Framework, how is it implemented? Using interfaces and classes. So the interfaces actually define the API, which are the, what are the methods available for all collections and what exactly a collection implements. Like for instance, it implements an iterator, so you can, iterable, so you can actually get an iterator out of uh, the collection. So we'll learn the common methods defined in collections interface for operating collections. In fact, you already know many of them from ArrayList from last semester. Sem uh, ArrayList is actually one of the collections in Java Collection Framework. We will, we will learn how to use the iterator interface, which is actually a design pattern that we will learn about uh, during the semester to traverse the elements in a collection. This iterator is actually what it is used for that for each loop that uh, traverses all the elements of a collection. And you remember starting with arrays, we, there is a third type of iterators or loops in Java, which is basically, or four type, because there are four standard for loops, while loops, do while loops, and for each loops. And actually internally is using iterator, the interface that we'll discuss today, and the main methods of iterator to get if there is a next element, has next and next. We will explore how and when to use array lists versus linked lists. They actually have the same API, only that array lists are implemented with arrays in the same way that we actually implemented array lists ourselves as an array that expands when there is no in, not enough space in the array list. And linked lists are implemented differently. They are basically implemented as an object element and a pointer or a reference to another element of the same type. So we'll learn how to implement linked lists, but you can think about it as a chain that you can basically uh, iterate from one element to another, and you can get to any one of the elements in the chain, but you cannot get as fast as a array list. So there are advantages and disadvantages of both. If you want to iterate over the elements of the array list and you want to access any element at any index, you would use an array list. As long as you only add and remove elements at the end, because the moment that you try to remove or uh, add an element in the middle of an array list, you will have actually remember what we were doing. We were shifting all the elements to the right with one position. Linked lists are more efficient for updates. You can insert and uh, add and remove elements at any index in a, co in a constant cost. As long as you have the element, you can get to that index in constant uh, cost. And we'll talk about more about efficiency of algorithms later this semester, but you will see in two different tests where array list performs better than linked lists and vice versa for uh, updates, linked list performs better than array list. 
Last semester, we learned the comparable interface. And we said that every element that uh, is comparable, we can compare it with another object. Or in this semester, in the first week, we learned about gene uh, uh, generics, and we can basically write a comparable for a specific type of object. However, sometimes you want to sort a collection or to find the maximum in a collection or any kind of comparisons, but different than the comparable uh, ob uh, interface. So let's say that you have uh, an array of uh, people and the person has a first name, a last name, maybe an age. And now you basically want to sort the uh, the elements of that array uh, by multiple criteria. You want to sort them by first name, or you want to sort them by last name, or you want to sort them by age. So with comparable, you can only have one sorting because you can only implement one superclass comparable. But with comparator, you can actually define the comparison method separately, and then you can either sort or find the maximum based on that comparator object. So we'll see the difference and how to implement such a comparator interface. Then we'll learn about the static methods in collections like sort, search, binary search, linear search, shuffling, uh, finding the largest, smallest elements in a collection, and so on. We will see an entire list of methods that you can use in uh, collections. We will also learn about the classical uh, implementation for vector and stack. They are basically classes that were implemented before Java 1.2 or Java 2 JDK 1.2, which were not following exactly the interface for Java Collections framework. And for historical reasons, they basically have for comp compatibility the previous methods defined. And they actually implement array list, and therefore you can basically use an array list for a vector or vice versa. And finally, we'll learn about queues, uh, priority queues, and we'll learn how to create priority queues. And then we'll have an example that uses stacks for parsing, a standard parser using stacks. And that's the goal for the class today, to learn about Java Collections Framework and all of these operations on Java Collections Framework. So let's start from basics. This class is self-contained, all the data is actually in the class itself. So a data structure or a collection is a collection of data organized in some fashion. So an array list is basically a sequence of elements of the same type. And you can get with uh, organized basically means that you can get to any element given the index. The advantage of uh, data structures as opposed to just arrays is that it doesn't only store data, but it also supports operations for accessing, manipulating the data. Like for instance, operations for comparison, for sorting and so on, maximum, minimum. And choosing the best data structure and algorithms for a particular task is one of the key elements in developing high performance software. And next class, we'll actually do a quiz in which we have it's a problem with five different uh, objectives, and we will see that which data structure is best to use for every single one of the objectives. So basically, if you don't have uh, regular updates, you would use uh, basically an array list. If you have updates within the data structure, you would use a linked list. And then if you want actually to store a set, you would use a set. For a hash map, for a dictionary, you would use a hash map and so on. So in object-oriented thinking, the same term data structure is also known as a container because it contains objects which are elements of that data structure. And we, I will use basically Java uses collection as the main word for such a data structure uh, in general in standard literature data structures is actually the keyword for data structures but in object oriented textbooks you will find container as the equivalent for a data structure i will use collection and data structure basically as my main terms but just to let you know that in textbooks that are more object oriented like big objects 
you would find container as the term for data structure. So we'll start with a standard data structure framework. And this one is the Java Collections framework. It comes by default with the uh, JDK, Java Development Kit. And it pro provides several data structures that can be used to organize and manipulate data efficiently. And it basically, it contains most of the necessary data structures that you would need for an application. It supports two types of containers. And as I said earlier, we have basically, we'll cover the first half today and the second half on Thursday, on Wednesday. So the first uh, set of containers are for storing a collection of elements. It's also simply called a collection. And it includes the different types of lists, array list, link list, vector, and they basically store an unordered collection of elements. Sets, they store a group of non-duplicated elements. Stacks, store objects that are processed in a last in, first out fashion. Remember that the stack last semester, when we implemented the last element that you push in is the first element that it pops out. Queues are a new data structure that you see probably today for the first time is basically a queue is first in, first out. You can think of a Starbucks, uh, basically, example where basically there is a queue and every person is take, it's served in the order that basically they were in the queue. In fact, this is a funny story that it happened to me that I was actually uh, getting a Starbucks and uh, uh, selling agent was basically, the cashier was putting the the basically the coupons for the people that were served on top of each other. And when they started serving, they would take the coupon on top. So it actually was working as a stack. Last person was actually the first served. And I explained to them what a queue is. That's basically that they have to flip the, 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 the receipts. And in that way, they first in, first out. And it was quite funny. They appreciated it. A priority queue is basically a queue that stores objects that are processed in the order that of their priority. So next class, we'll actually talk about sets and uh, maps. They are key value pairs. In Python, they are called dictionaries. Basically, you have a key and it gives you the value. Like for instance, if you are looking for in a phone book for some of this phone number, you would basically search the name and the name is the key and the value that is returned that you find for the phone number is actually the value. So that's a key value pair. That's why it's also called a dictionary because basically a phone book is like a dictionary. You have the word and the description and you are interested in the description, but you have the key for search, which was the word. Now, all the interfaces and classes defined in the Java Collections framework are grouped into one package, which you already know, java.util. And the design of this Java Collections framework is an excellent example of how interfaces are defined to define the, the basically the API, the general framework. Abstract classes provide some partial implementation for that are used in common to multiple subclasses. And finally, concrete classes are the actual implementations that we are using as, uh, as developers. So the idea of abstract classes is that sometimes many of the operations that are in common can be written only once, and then it's more convenient for the user and it's to learn only those methods. And it's more convenient for the developer that you basically have uh, uh, the methods that are implemented in common in one place and not application. Now, there is one subclass of collection, which basically abstract collection is really a convenience uh, class and or is called a convenience abstract class that groups all of the methods that are uh, that basically are implemented by the interface. So let me show you the example. This is the, the set of classes that we will learn. Basically, collection is an interface will all of the methods that are in common to Java Collections framework. 
It's implemented by other interfaces like set, list, and queue. Now we see that some of the interfaces like list and queue, queue is implemented also as a sub interface by DQ. And linked list, for instance, is one such example that implements it's a subclass of abstract sequential list, which is a subclass of, of abstract list and by default is a subclass of the interface list. So some of the classes like linked list implements multiple interfaces, implements DQ interface and by default uh, queue, but also it implements list. But let's summarize everything. Basically, there is a collection uh, interface that defines all of the methods in common to collections like add, remove. Uh, then there are the different types of collections, sets, lists, and queues. These are defining basically the methods specific for that type of the collection. So for a list, for instance, the, uh, there are methods to uh, sequentially iterate over the elements because the elements are actually stored internally as a sequence. For queue, there are standard methods for queue, for queues, offer and poll, which are basically the methods that are used for queue, queues to basically put an element on the queue and remove an element from the queue. Then sets is basically implemented by, again, by an interface sorted set, which basically are those sets that are sorted, not only that it's a set, but the elements are sorted based on the comparable or uh, uh, comparable interface. But there are also abstract sets uh, class, which is implements abstract collection, a super, a super class, and is implemented by hash sets and linked hash sets. Now, we will start with arrays, array list, and linked list. They are basically the standard implementations of lists in Java. Also, there is the priority queue class, which implements abstract queue, which implements the queue interface. Separate from basically collections, there are the dictionaries or maps. So the map interface defines the API for maps. It's again implemented by two branches, sorted maps, which eventually is implemented by tree map, super class, and abstract maps, which is implemented by hash map. This is a map that doesn't keep the elements in any sorted order. They use a different type of indexing to find the element in uh, uh, the collection. And we'll talk about how these are implemented later. One thing to notice in both of these uh, UML diagrams, is that we basically have interfaces, which are basically all of those interfaces that define the API and none of the methods are implemented. <clears throat> Abstract classes, which basically are all of the partial implementations, or even if they are empty implementations, they are basically used to group together all of the properties of uh, subclasses. And then there are concrete classes, those that you can use the new operator on to actually create an object of that collection. So the collection interface is the root interface for manipulating collections of objects. And the abstract collection class is basically a partial implementation of the collection interface. Basically, it has all of the methods in collection implemented with uh, basically the methods uh, using the methods that are implemented through polymorphies in the concrete classes. The few methods that are not implemented in abstract collection are add, size, and iterator, because these depend on the concrete collection that we actually are using. The collection interface implements the uh, iterable interface, which basically gives us a way to for traverse elements in collections. So here is an example. And basically what we see here is that collections, which is uh, abstract, uh, an interface, has all of the methods which are defined uh, for any collection, adding of an element. And you can see that this is already generic. That's why we did generics last class, because the input to add must be of the type that is parameterized uh, by the definition of the collection. So add adds an element and returns true or false. Add all takes another collection and adds all the elements of the collection C to the current collection. 
clear removes all of the elements from this collection contains two uh, contains takes an object and returns true if the collection returns uh, contains the object o and the, the comparison is done with the equals method contains all c where c is a collection returns true if the current collection contains all of the elements in the collection c equals compares the two collections basically it's implemented by the uh, subclasses concrete subclasses but it basically compares the two collections both on the elements that they store and the access mode because basically in a sequential list if the elements are in a different order even if they are the same the two collections are not equal hash code returns the hash code for this collection basically returns an int a long that represents the hash code for this collection we'll talk more about that later this semester when we talk about hashing techniques is empty returns true if the collection doesn't have any elements remove takes an object and returns true if it was found and removed and false otherwise if it was not found remove all a collection c removes all the elements in c from the current collection retain all removes all the elements that are not in c in this collection uh, that are both in c and this collection sorry about that size returns the number of elements in this collection and to array returns an array of objects of the elements in this collection now the collection interface although in the previous diagram we were not drawing it it actually implements the interface iterable and basically it, iterable contains a method iterator which actually returns an iterator object and this iterator has three standard methods has next that returns true if basically you start with the cursor at the first element and has next we return true if the iterator has more elements to traverse and false otherwise next we'll actually return the next element the where the cursor is currently in in that collection and remove removes the last element of that collection using the next method so basically one thing about remove is that is actually kept there again for uh, standardization reasons and uh, backward compatibility uh, it was there in the first implementations of the collections framework and therefore it was left in the it in the collection interface so in the in the iterator interface so let's see a couple of examples and i'm granting this example with the standard array list that we already seen before so in this class test collection i'm defining an array list of strings collection one and the first method that and basically i'm creating it with a new array list the array list is actually a concrete class and the first method that i'm showing is the add method so collection dot add takes an element and adds it as the last element of the collection and i'm adding also atlanta dallas and madison and if i want to print the elements of the collection i can basically print collection one or collection one dot string dot two string the standard method for returning a string then the next method that is in collection the collection interface is the collect the contains method so contains basically returns true or false if dallas is in the collect connection or not and since it is it will print that yes dallas is it's true remove removes dallas from uh, the collection again it's one of the api methods in collection and collection.size returns the size of the collection returns the size of the collection in the second uh, collection collection 2 is also a collection of strings i'm basically adding seattle and portland and if i print the collection it prints seattle and portland and i'm cloning the collection one which basically contained at by this time new york atlanta and madison into a new collection c1 and then from collection two i'm adding all the elements seattle and portland to uh, the collection c1 
and I'm printing C1, which basically is going to be uh, the, the, the cities New York, Atlanta, Madison, Seattle, and Portland. Next, basically, we are cloning uh, the collection one again, which contains the three cities, uh, New York, Atlanta, and Madison. Then I'm retaining from collection two all of the elements uh, in collection one. So the elements that are in common in collection two and they are also in collection one are basically none because there is nothing in common between collection two and C1. And then I'm uh, cloning again collection one and I remove all the elements that are also in, in collection two. And that basically gives me the difference between collection one minus collection two, which is the realist New York, Atlanta and Madison. So these are all methods which are in the collections framework. And basically you have to, you remember some of them from before, from a array list, add, remove, size. But now there are a few more that basically do add all, retain all and remove all. So all the concrete classes in the Java collections framework implement the clonable interface. So that's why we're able to clone and serializable interface, which we'll see later. Basically, actually we did add binary input output last semester. It basically can save an object as a binary stream. So you can save it in a file. You can load that binary stream and then basically you have the same object that you saved in the binary stream. Now, the only class that doesn't implement the clonable interface is the priority queue class. Everything else implements clonable and implements serializable. Some of the methods in collection interface cannot be implemented in the subclass. For instance, there are those read-only collections that cannot add and remove, and we'll talk a little bit more about them later. So you can actually get an array list out of another array list, but this array list is actually uh, an inner class to arrays and it actually it's uh, you can get as an array list an, an array but it's really just uh, an interface for getting the elements from the array there is not actually an implementation of array list that allows you to remove or add elements so in the case that a method defined for that class doesn't actually uh, work because it's like in the case of read-only interface uh, collections, uh, you can't do updates. Uh, you would get uh, unsupported operation exception, exception, and basically uh, that you can pass a string to that unsupported exception. Now, each collection is iterable. And what does it mean iterable? Iterator is a classic design pattern for walking through a data structure without having to expose how data is actually stored in a data structure. With a standard API, you would basically iterate over the elements. The collection interface itself, the super interface to all of the other interfaces actually extends that iterable interface and you can get an iterator object that it contains the methods has next, next and remove, uh, basically by get iter iterator uh, method. And you will basically, or uh, iterator method, and you will basically get an iterator object that is like a cursor over your interface. The iterable uh, interface defines, defines the iterator method, which returns an iterator. And that's exactly what is also used for each loops. Basically, when you have a for each element in collection, it uses the iterator over that collection. So really what we have here is this, that collections impl collection implements iterable, which has a method iterator, which gives you an object that you can of the type iterator that you can iterate over the elements with has next and next. And these are two methods that we actually seen before when you read from a file, 
even either text or uh, binary streams. But if you remember in text, you basically can write a while loop that reads every input separated by spaces, and then it goes with the cursor to the next input. And that's what is also iterator used for, parsing text. And here we have an example. So let's, for the same collection that we created before, that new array list that contains New York, Atlanta, Dallas, and Madison, I can get an iterator and with a while loop, as long as there are next elements, I basically get the next element with next, transform it to uppercase and continue. And this repeats exactly four times because there are four elements in my uh, data structure in my collection. And if you print the output, you will see that New York is capitalized, Atlanta is capitalized, Dallas is capitalized, and Madison is capitalized. So really what an iterator is, it gives you an object that allows you to iterate over the elements. And this is very important because for array lists, like we had before, you can iterate with an index. But for other types of data structures, you don't have those methods available to iterate over a sequence of elements you like for a set the order is not defined so you would want to get the elements one after another in any order and that's what an iterator is good for okay so now if we go back to this big uml the first uh, interface that we'll discuss uh, under collection is list so array list that we used before and also linked list and vector and stack are actually subclasses, concrete subclasses of list. So let's actually see what list interface implements and what exactly is a list. So a list is a collection that stores the elements in a sequential order. So you have the first element, the second, the third, and so on. And allows the user to specify where an element is stored at what index. The user can also access that element by index. And if you remember in some collections like arrays, you are actually guaranteed that you will get any element at any index in constant time. But that's not always true about lists. There are lists like linked lists in which to get the element, you have to iterate over the elements in the collection until that element, because they are not stored internally as a block of memory that of n elements of the same type. So you will have to iterate in a linked list one by one to go from the first element to the next element, the second element to the third element, and so on. Now, the list interface stores the elements in a sequence and permits duplicates. And there are two concrete classes in the Java Collections framework of list interface, array list and link list. These are the most popular ones that are used. There are also basically, the, we'll talk about two more later uh, base, uh, types of uh, basically lists, vector and stack. So here we have an example. So a list, Inter, the list interface is, extends the collection interface with additional methods. And usually these methods are based on that order traversal that you can store the elements in a sequence and permit duplicates and index them, traverse them using an index. So now we have methods like add at a given index. It adds an element at a specific index add all, that adds all the elements in the collection C at the specific index, get, which takes an index and returns an object of the type E, the parameterized type of that list. Index off takes an element and returns the index in that list. Last index off uh, uh, takes the element and returns the last index of an element that matches the element as passed as an input. List iterator returns a list iterator, which basically allows you to not only go further with next, but also to go previous with previous. 
So you basically can go in either direction with uh, these two inter these two inter uh, these two methods list iterator. Uh, list iterator start index basically returns the list iterator, but which the cursor is set at the start index. Remove takes an index and returns an, the element at that index and removes that specific element from uh, the array list or the list in general. Set will let you to update an element at uh, any specific index. And sublist from some from index to a to index returns a sublist also of the type list uh, with the elements within those two indices. Now, list implements list iterator. So in addition to having an iterator that allows you to go further, a list iterator extends a iterator and adds bidirectional traversal. So in addition to uh, next and has next, it has has previous and previous. And in addition to that, you also have next index that actually gives you what is the number of this element, the index of this element in the entire list. And set again takes an element and set the elements at that uh, specific element. Uh, returns the last element returned by the previous or next method with the spe speci uh, specified element. So as I said, list iterator, the main difference with iterator is that in addition to next, you have next index, returns the index of the next element in the iterator, and previous index returns the previous, the index of the previous element in the iterator. Add method inserts a specific element in the list right before the next element that would be returned by the method next. So basically you're adding it uh, next to it. And array list class and linked list class are two concrete implementations of list. A list can grow and shrink uh, dynamically. An array is fixed once it's created. But if your application doesn't require insertion or deletion of elements, then the most efficient data structure is still array. So if you don't have uh, insertion and deletion of elements, the most efficient data structure is still array, array. And the reason why is that you only store the elements. You do not have extra methods that are implement that are uh, uh, basically stored but available to the current element to actually to uh, or to iterate through the elements. So array is the most efficient because it does it only stores the elements and no behavior, no methods for that element. However, as we know, if you want to insert an element at some index, you have a complicated procedure to write to do it. Array list, it's, in, it's an array list implemented with an array internally. And linked list, as I said, it's a different technology. So the way that linked list, you can think about them is that you have a reference to an element. And this element has two parts, the value that we actually are storing and the pointer to the next element. And only when that pointer is null, you don't have a next element. So basically, you have a sequence of elements one after another, and one of the values or the dynamic fields is basically the value that you want to store, like v2, and the other one is the pointer to the next element. And this is basically repeated in every element. You basically have as the array list one reference to the first element in that array list. And then all of these are pointing to the next one and next one and so on. So now you can actually see why you basically get uh, those times that arrays are basically array lists are more efficient because they basically, the way that array list are, is implemented, this is a linked list. 
the way that an array list is implemented is that you have a single block of memory, which is an array internally, and each the elements are basically of equal size, and they are stored one after another. So if you want to get an el uh, some element in the middle of the collection, you can just take the address of the beginning of this collection and add to it the size of an element multiplied with the number of elements. So you basically can get this element in just an arithmetical operation. You add to the beginning address the number of elements multiplied with the size of one element. For linked lists, if you want to, you, you can do easy updates to add another element at any point. So for instance, you can add here an element and all that you have to do is to redirect the arrow from the previous point to this new element and then redirect it to the next element, okay? So that's basically it, array lists and linked lists. So it's really, which one do you want to use is based on how they are internally implemented performance wise. And let me actually explain to you what's the real difference between these classes. So if you need to support random access at any given index and you want to get from that index the element in constant time, what you can do is to basically use an array list because an array list is just a wrapper around the actual array which contains the elements of the, the, the list. If your application requires inserts and deletes at any place in the list, arrays are not good for that because you would basically have to shift elements in that uh, array list. Either shift left all the elements that follow that element that you removed or shift right. In any application, if, any, if your application requires the insertion or deletion of elements, at any place in the list, then you should use linked list. Because to eliminate an element here in the linked list view, it's very easy. Basically, you disable, let me actually cut it with it. You disable one such link, and then you basically just point the next pointer to the uh, element after the one that we deleted. If you delete the first element in the linked list, then all that you need to do is to change the pointer that was previously pointing to the previous element to the current element. And you can basically now address the rest of this array. You don't care what that element, uh, what happened with it. You are never going to use it ever again. So this is the difference between array list and linked lists. Basically they are, they have the same interface. There is no difference, but it, it is a difference in efficiency for an application of the two lists. Okay. Now, before I'm going to array lists and the methods available for array lists, let's see if there are any questions in the chat. Uh, the first question that I see is what, why can you go forward and backwards with the list iterator, but only forward with the collection iterator? That's a very good question because internally they are stored in some order. You need to actually get elements uh, in the collection. I'm not exactly sure because uh, it would make sense to have it if it's available, if it would be available in other types of collections. So I can take a look for next class. I do not actually know why uh, in a standard collection, you don't have go backwards. Now I know, and I explained why it happens. Basically, that's exactly what uh, Quinton is saying, that an iterator is used for going forward in any kind of collection. And the list iterator is used for going either forward or backwards in lists. But why is not uh, possible in any kind of collections that I do not know. I will have to look for next time. Okay, good. 
So array list has multiple constructors. There is the default constructor that we have used that creates an array list with no elements in it at the default capacity. There is the array list that you pass a collection and adds all the elements from that collection into the current array list. An array list constructor that creates an array list for a standard, uh, for a default uh, specified initial capacity. And trim to size is a method that basically trims the capacity of the array list to be the current uh, list size. So you don't have the extra capacity available. You only have the current elements. If you know, if you store a collection that is fixed, like let's say the letters in the alphabet, they are not going to change, then you can trim to size and you save some memory. Linked list has also constructors for creating a default empty linked list or a linked list that has elements from another collection. At first allows you to add an object at the beginning of the linked list, at last at the end. And now you can see basically at last is equivalent with add, but at first is something that linked list can do in unit time, basically in constant time. But uh, for an array list, you will have to shift all the elements to the right. So you can add an element at the beginning. Get first gets you a, basically a reference to the first element and returns that pointer and get last returns the last element from the list. Most of linked lists are actually implemented with double linked lists that you can actually go to the end and iterate back. That's why you basically have the backward iterator. We'll discuss about the ways to implement linked lists later this semester. And you will see that basically you have an element and internally you have data fields for the value and for the next uh, reference. Uh, get first and get last returns the first and last element and removes first and removes last, basically removes the first element or removes the last element. So these are constant operations because all that you need to do is basically to change a pointer, uh, the pointer that points to the first element or to uh, basically remove the last element and uh, change the pointer for last to the new last element. So again, when do you use array list versus linked lists? Basically, you will see that array lists are useful for uh, collections that you know how many elements are there and linked lists for those in which you have uh, lots of updates. And I've wrote a simple example that creates an array list with numbers and it inserts new elements into a specified location in the list using the index. I will basically do similar operations for linked lists, insert and remove from the list element elements from the list. And finally, I traverse the list backwards and forward using iterators with next and has next or previous and has uh, and uh, has previous. One other thing that you have to remember is that lists are not sets. They may contain identical elements multiple times, like the integer one is stored twice in the list. And here we have a couple of examples. So I create an array list. You see that the parent type of the array list is the list interface, but actually the concrete type is array list. So from the point of view of the, uh, the developer, he sees an, in, uh, an integer list interface. And I'm adding basically the in new integer objects, one, two, three, one, four. And these are out of boxed because basically int, int uh, primary values are transformed into the integer type. Now, I can add also elements at given indices. So I can add an element at the beginning of the array list and that element is 10. I can add an element, element 30 at index three. These are uh, expensive operations. For instance, adding an element at the beginning in an array list that is implemented with an array, which it is in, internally, it will shift all the elements to the right with one position from the end to the beginning and then it inserts the element. So the cost of adding an element in an array list is it can be as much as the number of elements in the, in the array list. 
which is basically O of n, if n elements are in the array list. Then I print the elements from the array list and I create a linked list. So in this linked list, I'm adding red, I'm removing the last element, and this array list is this linked list is actually created from the previous array list. So it started with the elements basically one, two, three, one, four, and uh, ten and thirty in the order basically that is given by the indices after shifting. And then I'm adding at position one red, which is done in constant time because in linked lists, basically it goes to that position and redirects the next element from index zero to red and from red back to the rest of the elements two and so on. Remove last, can remove the last element, add first, the adds an element again in constant time. All that we need to do is to Internally, what it does, it changes the reference to the first element to green, and uh, that element that contains green will have a pointer to the rest of the array list, of the linked list. Here we have an iterator, a for loop, that basically iterates from the end to the beginning using the index, and I'm using the method get i to get the elements from the linked list, which is actually quite inefficient. Then I'm actually doing exactly the same thing, uh, starting from the beginning using a list iterator. Has next will basically iterate further from the first element to the last element, and next returns the actual element. In the second example, list iterator is an iterator, uh, list iterator that basically takes the linked uh, list dot size, so it starts from the last element and I'm iterating backwards. So if it has a previous, it's true, then it takes a previous element, then it goes back and asks if there is a previous and so on. So basically this is the two types of iterators in linked lists uh, or lists, list iterators that can iterate over the elements from the first to the last with next and from the last to the first using previous. And here are the examples. So for instance, the list of integers after inserting all of those elements are 10, 1, 2, 30, 3, 1, 4. Then after I insert red and basically uh, it, I want to display the list backwards with an index, it basically prints the elements that we see uh, there, 1, 3, 30, 2, 1, red, 10, green. And forward, it would be basically green, 10, red, 1, 2, 30, 3, 1. And then again backwards, but this time using an iterator. So the difference is that in the first, in, in the first time I displayed the elements in the second display, basically I pay a cost of n square, o n square to display the elements, as opposed to n in the case of the iterator use. So this is what I was basically saying, that the get i method is available for linked lists, but is very time consuming to find each element. And if you want to write an iterator, uh, an iteration, you shouldn't write it with the index because that will actually give you a quadratic time. You should write it with a for each loop because that actually uses iterator because the way that is internally implemented linked lists, in order to find an element at, a, at a some index, like let's say that this is i, you would have to start from the beginning all the time to get to the element at index i. So basically that's why if you had get i for every position, zero, one, two, and so on, it starts from the beginning for every element, for every index. So starts from the beginning for the second element, starts from the beginning for the third element, starts from the beginning to the fourth element, and so on. Professor, can you hear me? Go ahead. Um, I had a question for how the list iterator like has um, a method called like uh, that that can go that can go like previous in a mm -hmm. linked list. Like is doesn't a linked list like store the address of of the element that's in front of it? Uh, unless like it's a doubly linked list, right? Exactly. And internally, it's actually, it is a double linked list. That's why you can get the last element 
or you can remove the last element in constant time. All of these, uh, all the basically implementations of linked lists are double linked lists. And that applies to uh, Java too. So it doesn't matter if you start from the first element or you start from the last element. Basically, if you want to get an element somewhere here, you will have to iterate over some number of elements to get to that. So get i still gives you a very bad efficiency, even if it's uh, double linked. OK, thank you. Welcome. But it's still, basically, you have in both directions. And that's why you can get the iterate implemented internally with double linked lists. So that's why you can get either for, uh, forward or backwards iterators and use them. Because both array list and uh, linked list is actually implemented with a double linked list, array list. You just use the index, or basically the iterator just uses the index to decrease it with one. OK, good. So get i, you shouldn't use it for linked lists. Now, earlier last semester, we talked about comparable. So comparable, basically, it was an interface that you implemented in several classes. And you used to you used the compare to method to compare uh, basically the current element with another element, and it will return zero or a negative value or a positive value depending which one was bigger. However, sometimes you want to use, to compare elements that are not instances of comparable, or by a different criteria than comparable. So, for instance, for a person. You would want sometimes to compare by last name, sometimes by first name, sometimes by age or anything else. And you can define separately for, from comparable. You can still have one main comparison method, which is in comparable. But you can define in a separate object a different comparable, a comparator, to compare objects. So java.util.comparator permas for the type of the object is an interface and it has basically two methods compare and equals compare is a method that takes two elements of the type t element one and element two and returns like comparable the, like the compare to method a negative value if element one is less than element two zero if the two elements are equal or a positive value if they are basically element one is greater than element two. So what is it used for? Basically, first let's define a comparator example. So remember we had that class geometric object and usually we compare geometric objects by areas or by perimeter and so on. So if we want to write a comparator for area, we would basically implement the comparator class geometric object comparator, implements the comparator uh, interface for geometric object. And basically we have the compare method that takes two geometric objects, computes their areas with get area because no matter object, what object it has a get area method get area was implemented as abstract in geometric object and then we compare the two areas so if area one is less than area two then we return a negative value minus one if the two areas were equal we return zero if the first area is greater than the second area we return a positive value one and here is an example max so max can be a class a method that takes two geometric objects and the comparator for geometric objects. And for that comparator, we basically compare the two geometric objects and we return if G1 is greater than G2, it is greater than zero, then it returns G1 as the maximum. Otherwise, it returns G2 as the maximum. And in the main method, we create two geometric objects, a rectangle of uh, five by five, height and width, and the circle of radius of five. And as we can see, the max method is invoked for the two geometric objects and the new instance of geometric object comparator, the class below. 
So basically uh, the class before the previous class, this one. So basically if you want the larger of the two, you would basically assign the value written by max to G, which in this case is going to be the rectangle because basically the circle will be contained within that rectangle or square of size of five. So why did we actually talk at this moment about comparators? Because the collections interface, uh, the actually the collections also contain, the interface that also, also contains static methods to perform common operations in a collection or a list. And those common operations are the standard ones, maximum, minimum, and they can take a comparator or they can use the default comparable interface implemented for that specific class. We also have sort, or again, by either comparator or comparable, binary search if they are already sorted to find an element at a given, uh, with a given key, reverse to reverse the entire collection in place, shuffle to basically randomly shuffle the elements of the collection, copy, fill methods. And here we have the two sort methods. The default sort method, which uses the compare to method to basically sort the elements of a list. And the sort method, which takes a list and the con comparator object to compare object to compare the elements and in that case it will use the compare method in comparator interface to actually sort the elements and return the minimum first and next one and so on so this is the set of all of the static methods there are those methods that are used for lists like sorting binary search reverse reverse order uh, shuffle, sh uh, uh, copy, and copies, and fill. And we'll talk about all of this next. Maximum, minimum, disjoint, and frequency. There are more than that in the collections framework as important methods, rotate at a, with a given distance, replace all objects, old value with a new value, index of sublist, if you pass the source list and the target list, returns the index within the source where you start having elements, exactly the same elements as in target. Last index of sublist is similar to basically index of sublist, only that this time we return the index of the last copy. Swap takes two indices, integers in, the, in a list and swaps those two elements in place. And add all takes another collection and adds all the elements of that collection to the current collection. So here we have a couple of examples, basically sorting. So first thing, we basically have a list, which it's arrays.s list. So arrays.s list is actually returns a special array list called array list with the same name but it's actually an internal class, an inner class to arrays. And it has this feature that you cannot basically uh, modify it. It's an uh, immutable array list. Sort will basically take that list and sort it. So blue, green, red will be in sorted order. To sort it in descending order, you can also uh, sent back the comparator. In this case, it's easy to write a comparator because what you do, you return the negative value of whatever comparable it returns. So basically, you uh, reverse order returns a comparator that implements a single method for compare, which returns the inverse of compare to. Or you can basically pass to the sort method the list and a comparator object, which is written by uh, collections.reverse uh, order, in which case you basically gather uh, the elements in reverse order, in reverse lexicographical order, as we can see here. Binary search. But before we go to binary search, let's see if there are more questions. So that's exactly basically what I said before, that Java uses a double linked list 
to implement a linked list. And that's why you have list iterators that go uh, forward and backwards. Chaudhuri, you probably asked something, but we, none of us heard you. If you want, you can actually type the question. Good. So binary search takes a sorted collection, in this case, a sorted array, uh, as an array list, and search is the index of basically the element seven in that array list. In this case, is basically two. If it doesn't find it, it will return where it should have been uh, if it was in the array list. So in this case, basically binary search for nine, we return minus four. Minus one would be basically if it would have been at the beginning and so on. So minus four really means that it's after seven, but before 10. Last, basically in the second list, uh, the index of red was two and the index of cyan was minus two. Reverse takes a list and basically reverses that list. It, 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 it returns the elements in, the, in the, the elements in the list are now in reverse order. So blue, green, red, and yellow. Shuffle creates a random shuffle of that list. So basically it will uh, shuffle the elements in the list. And if you want to print an element, you will get with equal probability, basically any element of the list. Uh, if you want to pass a seed for the random generator, you can basically pass it as a new random object right after the as the second argument of shuffle. And here we have an example. For instance, if you shuffle list one with a random of 20 and list two with a random of 20, you would get the same pattern, the same. So what is this used for? Because the random, it, it's still the same random object. So the hash function will return the elements in the same sh shuffled order. So if I print, let me actually do this because this is a nice example. If I actually do this example, order between the two data structures is actually kept. So let me import the Java util and I will import all of them. So, and if we print it, you will see that no matter how I shuffle with the same random value, Basically, I get the same shuffle, blue, yellow, red, and green, and it corresponds to BYRG, the one below. So same random gives you the same shuffling. If you want to modify it, but it's still the same, you have the elements in basically different order, blue, red, yellow, and green, but in both of the two uh, lists. So. Basically, the random object is really the same. Copy copies all the elements from a source to the destination with the same index. So for instance, if I have list one is yellow, red, green, blue, and list two is white, black, a copy from uh, into the source into the list one from list two will basically override white over yellow and black over red. And the rest of the elements are still the same. Now, one thing that you have to remember is that it actually compares with equals. So even if we create objects with new operator, it basically, uh, they are still equal. Now, if the list is in the destination is smaller than the source, then you will get a runtime error. Basically, you get an index out of bound exception. Now, I mentioned this method as list that basically exists in the arrays class. So if you give an array or a sequence of elements, it creates an array list, which is an internal list in arrays, java.util.arrays dollar sign array list, which is called array list and it actually implements the list interface. However, it's just a wrapper for the array. So it's just that it has methods 
for accessing with get and so on but it's just a wrapper for the array it still takes the same index elements from that original array so it's basically an immutable array list that only belongs to one sub it's as an inner class of arrays so let's continue with other static methods for lists and copies take n and an object o and creates a list of n elements of that have all the all of them the value o and basically here we have an example and copies of new gregorian calendar of uh, january 1st 2020 actually it's february 1st 2020 because february months start with zero for gregorian for calendars it basically returns a list one which contains it's an array list uh, uh, basically with five copies of the same date now it's immutable so you cannot add remove or update that list because it's really just an inner uh, class of uh, arrays another example is uh, here we have n copies five times that date is basically an instance of uh, java.util.collections copies list fill it's a method that replaces all the elements in the list with a specified element so fill the list with black will basically contain a list with only black with the same number of elements as it, as it was at the beginning max and mean are obvious they basically return the maximum and the minimum with uh, with respect to uh, comparable in the collection if we want a different order then you basically you can get max and mean with uh, a comparator object this joint it's a method that returns true if two collections have no elements in common so for instance if we have these collections here and i'm saying our collection one and collection two disjoint is false because red is in common but what about collection one and collection three they don't have any elements in common so it will return true frequency you give a collection and an element and it returns how many times that element is equal with the elements in the collection so basically if you want the frequency of red in the array list red cyan and red it will return two if you want the frequency of new string red into cyan new string red and red it's still two it's actually three and the reason for that is the equals method basically it cannot be three because red it's it's only listed twice so i think i have a typo here let me just check it Three. Oh, I have a new string at the beginning and two more string reds afterwards. So it is three times. It's right at the beginning with a new string, then another new string, then red. So basically the intern string red. So it is three times. Red is three times in that collection. Then how many times we have red if we compare red, a new string red with the two strings red that we have as intern strings is twice and we can move on to vector and stack. Let's see if there are any questions. No. Good. So the Java collections framework was introduced with Java 2 or what we call JDK 1.2. And some data structures were, uh, pri uh, were supported prior to Java 2. Among them was vector and stack. And they are quite used. So a lot of applications that are actually implemented in Java, like the Tomcat uh, web server, is actually uh, implemented with, uh, with vectors. So in order to maintain the implementation and fit into fit them into the java collection framework 
basically they were updated for compatibility. So vector is also a subclass of uh, uh, abstract list and stack is a subclass of vector. Vector is the same with array list except that it contains synchronized methods. Synchronized, I don't know if you remember from last semester, one area that is a critical area, like a method, may be entered by one thread, only one thread at any given time. So synchronized is a keyword in Java that creates such an atomic block of memory that no two threads can actually be in that uh, critical area at the same time. And such synchronized methods are used in concurrent programming, like multi-threading, to prevent data corruption when the vector is accessed and modified. So you don't have a race condition to basically uh, corrupt memory and execute non-atomic operations on the collection. None of the classes that we discussed up to now are synchronized. They basically, if there are multiple threads, whichever gets first to the uh, uh, methods, invocations will be executed. And the thread scheduler gives a slice of the time to every thread. And the developer cannot control how much time is given and when. Now, vector contains synchronized methods. That means that only one uh, runtime can be in any, uh, basically, um, a critical area at one time. So vector, because of the fact that it's synchronized, is less efficient than a ray list. However, for multi-threaded applications, you would want to use it because you will not have memory corruption and all of your uh, transactions will be acid, basically atomic, independent, consistent, and the data will be updated. Uh, so there are two methods which are basically retained from Java 2. And one of them is add element, which is the same with add, except that add element is synchronized. And here we have the UML diagram for vector. So vector implements everything from array list, but it basically implements those additional method add element for adding an element to the current vector. Stack is a last in first out stack of objects. And it contains usually the two methods, standard methods that you remember, push and pop. And the elements will be accessed only from the top of the stack. You can insert or, or retrieve or remove an elements from the top of the stack only. The stack is implemented as an extension to vector. And again, it has a method that it's kept for compatibility reasons. It's uh, basically called empty. And it's the same with is empty in collections. And here we have the standard methods, pick, pop, and push for accessing elements in a stack and removing or adding elements to a stack. Queues. So a queue is a data structure where the element that was added first is removed first, second element added is removed second, and so on. So elements are appended at the end of the list, and they are removed from the beginning which gives you this basically queue uh, technology. The method used for adding elements at the beginning is called offer. And is what is preferred in a queue. Really similar to the add method, but it uh, prefer, its offer is preferred for queues. The poll and remove methods are similar, except that poll returns null if the queue is empty and removes, uh, uh, remove throws an exception. The pick and element methods are the same, except that pick returns null if the queue is empty and element throws an exception. In a priority queue, elements will be assigned priorities. But let's start with basically uh, simple queues. So there is the queue interface with the methods offer and uh, uh, basically uh, offer and DQ. Then there is the DQ interface that is a double uh, queue, double ended queue. 
and there are basically implemented by the concrete classes linked lists for simple queues and priority queue for priority queues. So the queue interface has the offer method, poll method, remove, pick, and element. And the, the linked list implements both list and the queue. So you can basically do queue operations with linked lists. And here I have an example. So DQ is basically supports insertion and removal at both ends. It's short for double-ended queue. It extends the queue interface with methods for inserting and removing elements from both ends, from the end and from the beginning. In this example, basically I will show you add first, add remove first, add last, remove last, uh, get first and get last. So I'm creating a linked list, which is apparently uh, as an apparent type a queue. And I offer the elements Oklahoma, Indiana, Georgia, and Texas. And once I start removing them with remove, it basically returns them in the order that we inserted them. Oklahoma, Indiana, Georgia, Texas. Linked list is a concrete class for queue and supports insertion and removing of elements at both ends with the same uh, efficiency. Priority queues. Priority queues are very important, usually for statistical algorithms. When you want to find out how many times, let's say, some page is referenced, and you want these pages returned in, in order of priority. By default, a priority queue contains elements that are compared with comparable, and the element at the with the least value is a assigned the highest priority in the priority queue, and thus is removed from the priority queue first. If there are several elements with the same highest priority, the tie is broken arbitrarily, it's random. You can specify the order using a comparator for a priority queue, in which case you basically invoke the constructor for priority queue with that comparator and initial capacity. And here we have an, uh, the UML diagram, a priority queue can be created by default of capacity of 11, or it can be created uh, with a default capacity, or we can create a priority queue for uh, a collection, and, or we can actually create a priority queue with a comparator. And here is an example. Let's assume that we start pushing elements in Oklahoma, Indiana, Georgia, and Texas in this priority queue. And then we want to print and to remove the last element. So in this case, it basically the first element. It uh, the first element in order. So basically, it, uh, it, it prints out Georgia, Indiana, Oklahoma, and Texas, because Georgia had the highest, the lowest score, but it was removed first, Indiana the second lowest, and removed second, and so on. Next, in the next example, I do exactly the same example, but if the size is greater than uh, zero, I remove the element from the priority queue, and I print it. Now, an, the most used case for stacks is to execute programming languages. And either that we implement a method using a method evaluation using stacks, or we want to evaluate expressions. Those are also used, uh, computed using stacks. And here is an example. Let's assume that somebody gives us in a string an entire arithmetical formula like the one that we have here, one plus three multiplied with three minus two, everything multiplied with 12 divided by six multiplied with five. How is this parsed? Because as you can see, it's quite complicated. In phase one, we can actually, uh, for parsing such an infix uh, exp uh, expression with infix operators, infix means that the operator is between the two operands. And this is done from left to right by looking at the parentheses and using two stacks. So if the element extracted is an operand, we put it in the operand stack. If it's a plus, 
then we process all the opera operators from the operator stack and the corresponding elements from the uh, main stack, the operand stack, and we basically compute the, the formula, either multiplication or division or addition or of subtraction. If the operator is close parentheses, like we have in this example, then we basically pull out uh, the uh, open parentheses and then we start reading continuously and putting them in the stack and filter and basically uh, return back and check the condition. So here I have an example. So this is the string. I start with one. One is put on the operand stack. Then I have a plus. There is no multiplication prior, so I just stay as is. Then I add two. And now, because the cursor is at the, basically at this position, one plus two will be basically computed to three. And now it basically changes the value on the stack. So it's a three. Then we have multiplication with four. So it will push into the stack uh, four, and then it does the multiplication. And here is the example. First, we have a main method in which it asks the user to enter Java evaluates expression and the expression within double quotes. Then the evaluate expression takes the string. First, it creates the stack of integers and stack of characters. Then we start scanning the tokens. So as we read tokens like go and so on from left to right, the length of the to token changes. And uh, on the separate branch, we basically look at uh, uh, basically the rest of the, the characters, the tokens. If the token is uh, multiplication or division, then we process all from top of the stack until it finds an operator that is different than multiplication and division, at which time it basically calls process an operator with operator stack to actually find what was the operation. And uh, it basically, that's it. Now, the rest of the parser basically does operations. So if the character, the operand operator is popped out from the stack and so are the operands OP1 and OP2, then we check if the operator is multiplication, we do the addition, we do the addition. If it's subtraction, we do the subtraction and so on for uh, multiplication and division. Okay, good. So let me show you actually a simpler example, and this will be actually useful for your uh, to write your own quiz. So given multiple strings, you want to find out if the input has the correct parentheses. Like for instance, I have here a bunch of examples. This is not the correct input because basically this bracket is ended with a single curly brace. This is a correct input. We have an inner input, which is the empty string. We have another empty string. We have uh, one of the sub uh, parentheses, open, close, and so on. And the advantage of the stack is that every time you get a close parentheses, you look at the top of the stack of uh, the actual problem, and it should not have open parentheses. It should have open parentheses, the corresponding uh, inverse parentheses. And here is the implementation. So let me decrease a little bit the font. Okay. So basically, if it's one of the open parentheses, we just push it on the stack. Otherwise, if it's a closed parentheses, then it checks if the stack is empty, it returns false. If not, it pops the element. And if it's open parentheses, then it breaks. Otherwise, it returns false. And that's exactly what I'm basically doing. For every open parentheses, I'm looking for a closed parentheses of the same type, at which time I'm emptying the stack and I pop the, element, the 
basically the open parentheses from the stack. And similarly, square bracket does exactly the same thing but for square bracket. And that's what I want you to implement for your quiz. And in fact, I'm going to post it on Piazza so you can just consult after you implement it. Okay. So this is quiz two, which is a simple parenthesis parser. And we want it as code. I don't unfortunately see it as code. Okay, good. So that's basically today's lecture. Uh, the basic data structures in uh, Java collections. Any questions? Vector is a subclass of abstract list, while Q is separate from lists. That's totally correct, actually. So vector, you can see it here. Vector is a subclass of uh, abstract list, and linked list is a separate. Uh, actually, it is also, Q is separate. That's completely true. So actually the only one that is separate is priority queues. Linked list is also a subclass of list, abstract list. However, it actually implements a DQ and a queue. Yes. So I think we are we agree that this is exactly the, the UML diagram for collections, vector stack, and so on. So we'll take a short break. Basically, we are just on time. And after this short break, uh, I'm going to stop the recording. And you can start working on the uh, quiz, the lab three, which is really to continue implementing generic stacks uh, and other generic data structures uh, this class. That's all for today. Thank you very much. See you next class.